I have a complicated relationship with book talk. I love the people. I love the community. I love that reading is now seen as cool and hip. It gives me hope that my generation will retain brain cells past the age of 25, but I'll be the first to admit that a lot of the popular canon of book talk recommendations are a bit hit or miss. But regardless, I keep reading them. I'm nosy. I like having opinions on popular things. So this week I'm taking on three viral TikTok romance novels. One I find already deeply suspicious, one that I think I might really like, and one that is a fantasy that I truly have no preconceived notions about. And I'm going to read these delightful books with you and give you my honest and spoiler-free opinions on whether or not they're worth it. And lying is for traitors, and I'm also bad at it, so you can expect me to keep it pretty real. <laughs> and with that, the first book that we're going to be reading for this video is The Spanish Love Deception, which, let me just say, is a particularly divisive one among the girls on BookTok. I have seen many a post slandering this book, begging people to throw their copies of it into the ocean. But then I've also gotten the vibe that there is a substantial faction of women who are basically building altars in their closets to worship this man in this book because they love him so much. So it's pretty extreme. There seem to be no other opinions. And any of you who know me well will know that books like that are where I feed. I love drama. I love controversy. Deep down, I feel like I'm no better than a goblin. So obviously I had to pick this for this video. And this is also, I think, probably the most popular TikTok romance novel that I have not yet read, which is a big statement for sure. But I think that it's probably true. This has over 700,000 Goodreads ratings, which is insane. That's like hating game levels of popularity. This book has a little over 400 pages. I'm kind of hoping to get through all of it today. We'll see. I have like the entire afternoon and I will be consuming this immediately and reporting back with my thoughts. But before we jump into this just absolute masterpiece, I want to give you guys a word from today's sponsor, which is Parade. I have had the pleasure of working with Parade before on this channel, and it's safe to say at this point that I absolutely adore them. Speaking as someone who has lived like solely in bralettes since I was a teenager, discovering a place where I could find cute, affordable, and comfortable options was a really big deal for me. And Parade fortunately ticks all of those boxes and so much more. I have lived essentially all of my days these past weeks inside of this brown bralette from their new and like super cute Betsy Johnson collection that they did for February. And it fits me like a second skin. I'm like sad whenever I have to put it into the washing machine. It feels like saying goodbye to a friend. But honestly, this is just the most recent in a pretty long line now of bralettes from Parade that I absolutely adore. I have loved every fabric type that I've tried. They're all delightful. I've always hated feeling like I'm wearing a bra. It's just a sensory experience that I really dislike. And it's really nice to not have that problem with Parade. Their bralettes have really worked for me. So if any of that sounds relatable to you, or if you just want to be effortlessly hip and fashionable, you can check out Parade through the link in my description and use my code NOVA40 for 40% off site-wide. Strongly recommend. I love them. And thank you so much to Parade for sponsoring this video. Let's get back to it. The Spanish Love Deception is a fake dating, enemies to lovers, office romance, just trope-filled adventure that follows a woman named Catalina, who is the maid of honor in her sister's wedding, which is happening over in Spain. But the catch to this event is the best man in the wedding is her evil loser ex-boyfriend. And it turns out that he's engaged now, so Lena can't show up to this wedding on her own or she feels like she'll never live down the shame. Some time goes by and she's still struggling to find this date until randomly her tall, dark, and handsome office nemesis, her enemy, Aaron. Aaron hears about this entire conundrum and he offers to help her out in exchange for her accompanying him as a fake date to some other event. And she has no other options, so that is what they do. They have to somehow survive this weekend and convince everybody else that they're in love, despite the fact that they're enemies who hate each other. Initial thoughts. I'm a little bit over 100 pages in. I just can't take enemies to lovers seriously when it's in a contemporary romance. You have to have a real reason to be enemies, and most people in the real world do not have that luxury. They don't have like 12 generations of family that have been locked in magical warfare. They don't have a sister who was stolen from them at age 10 to be the sacrifice into this volcano to power the magical battery of a world, except now, oh no, you've been partnered with the prince of the family that lets this happen every year, and you have to like secretly assassinate him before it's too late or whatever, but he's also really hot. These are stakes that just do not exist inside of this book, and the juice is not there. And I am sick of protagonists in like 90% of enemies to lovers contemporary romances seeing it as this impossible and deep affront to their whole character and personality and like identity as a person to admit that they think that this guy that did one mean thing to them two years ago might actually be sexy and nice now. These girls will act in their internal monologues like acknowledging that is something that will shatter their entire self-image. That's just not who they are. That's not who they are together. What do you mean? Who cares? It's been two years. Just get over yourself and kiss, okay? It is truly that simple. Just have one adult conversation. I promise it's not going to kill you. And this isn't even that bad so far. It just represents the kind of enemies to lovers that I really dislike. Clearly they're not even enemies. He likes her. She has a completely dumb and arbitrary reason for not liking him that she will spend probably the rest of this book questioning until ultimately she realizes that it was stupid all along. And the banter is just not good enough to justify a conflict that makes my brain feel this eroded. Just some quotes for you to demonstrate 
demonstrate the type of banter that I've been dealing with. So context is Aaron arrives at her apartment to pick her up for his fake date and he goes, are you going to let me in or do you always keep guests outside your door while you insult them? Who said you were a guest? You invited yourself over, I said over my shoulder. I guess you don't mind letting yourself in either, huh, big boy? Still not able to believe I had really called Aaron Blackford big boy. I headed for the kitchen area of my studio and opened the fridge. <laughs> Big boy, yup, another nickname that she comes up with. Just because they're such enemies, like they hate each other for such real reasons. She starts to call him Clark Kent because he apparently looks like Superman, but to make it like an insult that really hits him hard, she goes, Thor or Captain America? That would have been a compliment, but you are not a Chris. Plus, no one cares about Superman anymore, Mr. Kent. What do you mean? Everybody thinks that he's hot. You don't have to be so bossy. Not everyone has super speed like you, Mr. Kent. Quite the contrary. Some even have the opposite superpower. Ha! I rolled my eyes. Funny. This is what the people have given me to work with. This is the juicy banter that I was promised. Oh man. I have another 300 pages of this book. There's still time. I'm gonna keep reading. We'll see how things change. I'm going to pick up some dinner because this book is not feeding me. So I ended up getting Peruvian, which big surprise, I get it constantly. It's one of my favorite types of food. I also got chicha, which is one of my favorite bevs on this planet. It's so good and so hard to describe. It's kind of like a woodsy, nutty grape juice. And I love it. If I could and it wouldn't kill me, I would put this shit into an IV bag and just pump it directly into my body at all hours of the day. It's fantastic. I swear to God, if she talks about how this man's eyes remind her of the ocean one more time, he has the bluest eyes in the Milky Way. There have never been eyes so blue. And the way that we know that is she has to mention them every single page. Like, listen to this, okay? This woman just fainted. My eyelids fluttered open for an instant, finding two blue spots that made me think of the ocean. And then literally two paragraphs later, as I blinked slowly, my vision started to return in flashes. Deep blue eyes, hair as dark as black ink, the hard line of a jaw. And then one page later, Aaron, I whispered, blue eyes met mine for an instant. Hold on, almost there. I am going to implode. I can feel my neurons dying. I feel like the descriptions in this book were written for people with dementia. If Catalina and I ever run into each other in the wild, it is on site for the time that she is wasting inside of this book. He called me sexy? Oh, it must be all an act. I am going to punch a wall. Blood will be spilled. It's not a slow burn if one of your characters is just fucking stupid. <laughs> What do you think about this book? Do you have strong opinions? What thoughts are going through that little brain of yours? He has no thoughts. There are no thoughts inside of this head and I love him for it. <clears throat> he looked down at his hands and his eyelids sheltered the blue in his eyes for just a heartbeat. He blinked. He blinked away the fact that his eyes were blue, but you had to remind us that his eyes were blue so that way we would know that when he blinked, he was hiding away his blue eyes. Come on. <laughs> What do you think about that, Onyx? He still has no thoughts. There's nothing going on in there. My camera battery died, and honestly, it's for the best because I can't take this anymore, but I just want to say, this is adulthood, okay? I'm eating edible cookie dough while sitting in the basement of my ancestral childhood home and reading what should be smut, but instead is just 300 pages about how blue this man's eyes are. Mmm. Tastes like freedom. <laughs> I'm gonna finish this chapter and then go to bed. I will talk to you more tomorrow. Hi, good morning. I have about 150 pages left of this absolute masterpiece. And you know what? I can't hold myself back any longer. Let's dig in. We would be sharing this very same bed tonight. That fact had somehow fled my mind until now, and its return did strange things to my belly. Things that were not strange in a funny way, but in a rather exciting way. Things that heated my skin. <laughs> His large body and my much smaller one sharing and crowding the modest space the mattress offered. This writing will be the death of me. <sighs> we carry on. Listen to this. I'm not broken, Aaron. I can't be. You are not. And I know that even if something did break you, because that's life and no one is invincible, you'd still put the pieces back together and remain the brightest thing I'd ever seen. Aww. That is tender. You have to admit it. <clears throat> I want to feel you milking me, baby. Why live? <laughs> okay, I'm done. <laughs>
if you like this book, if this sparks joy, I'm glad for you, okay? Sometimes you just need a silly goofy read to take the edge off of life, but this was not for me. I find it really funny that I pulled The Hating Game as a comparison because they have virtually the same amount of Goodreads ratings because that is exactly what I feel this book is trying to be. It's like a Shein version of The Hating Game. In that book, I have it somewhere here actually. This isn't like God's gifts to humanity, but it is fun. And this... It wasn't like as bad as I've heard some people say. It gets a lot of flack I feel for being boring, but if you put it into a comparison with Icebreaker, for example, this book is like four split screens of Subway Surfers during a comedy special. Like Maybe I've just been hurt before by books that are even worse than this one, but I do feel like there were a decent amount of events that were going on during the story. But with that said, were any of those events good? Were any of them worth my time? <laughs> I'm not sure. And what was boring and just truly grating and probably added about 150 extra pages to the runtime of this book was the ceaselessly repetitive inner monologue of the main character, Catalina. She was so dumb, like beyond the pale levels of dumb with her inability to sense the completely obvious at all times feelings of this man. And she doesn't stop being dumb until you're on like page 350. So that was annoying for sure. Also, they had no chemistry in my opinion. Like we get it, okay? He's big, she's small. That's not enough. Their banter was really mid, like they were never really enemies so you never really got a massive amount of tension and I was just left with what felt like crumbs inside of this book like you have scenes where this woman is dropping her pants because she has just found out that he likes animated movies and his favorite animated movie is up Lena sincerely inside is just like this is too much for me like I cannot abide with how sexy this man is when he talks about up the Pixar animated film the bar is in hell the bar is in hell and reading this book I was in hell with the bar <laughs> and without talking about chemistry if anybody ever asks me to milk them I cannot be held responsible for my actions, okay? I might disappear. I might leave the state and change my name and never talk to anybody ever again. It, it, who knows? In terms of characters, I can understand why people like Aaron in this book. I feel like he's sweet. He does some cool things in the back half, but I am just begging all people out in the world to raise your standards to men who can just say nice things to you when they like you instead of being vaguely passive aggressive in the office for two years and then wondering why you don't take the hints that he's obsessed with you. The way this book could have been five pages long if this 30 year old man wasn't so repressed about the fact that he had a crush on her. So much could have been different. So much could have been avoided. Also, last thing, I just want to say that the 90% conflict in this book was truly wild. This Spoilers, by the way, I guess. I mean, this is a romance novel, so you probably know where this is going, but just skip ahead like 30 seconds if you care. This man's dad, his estranged father, just randomly has cancer and is about to die. So Aaron flies out to go see his dad during this 90% miscommunication that they're having. And when she finds out about this, she flies out to support him and they have this cheerful reunion and I love you session just outside of this dying man's hospital room. But then he doesn't even die in the epilogue one year later, he's still kicking the can around. It was just so random. Like why introduce that in the 11th hour? Why have that? as the background for your tearful I love you kiss. Oh man, um, I think that this probably gets 1.5 stars from me, maybe two. No, 1.5. Who am I kidding? A book does not have to be offensive to be bad. And this was bad. And I wish that I could have my several hours back. Anyways, the next book I'm reading for this video is Butcher and Blackbird. And I, dare I say, I'm looking forward to this book. I actually think that they could be camp in a way that I really enjoy. But I am really hungry and I haven't had lunch. So I'm gonna go do that and then come back and then explain more about this book to you, okay? Okay, okay, hello. I got lunch so hard that it flung me into the next day. I got sidetracked with some other stuff, but I actually did start this last night off camera because I, I just couldn't resist before bed. So let's talk about it. The premise for this is something else. Honestly, this entire book is something else. It follows these two serial killers, except they're like Dexter style serial killers. So they only target other murderers and or just really the absolute scum of human society. And at the beginning of this book, one of them, Sloan, she takes out this guy who as a last act ends up locking her inside of a cage. So she's trapped. She she kind of thinks that she's doomed until fortunately a couple of days later Rowan shows up with the intent of killing this now dead murderer only to find this guy already dead and Sloane inside of the cage. So he rescues her, they meet up and they recognize each other as this kind of kindred spirit. Turns out there aren't that many murderers who are doing it quite like them. So they get along swimmingly and they end up deciding to keep in touch through competing in this once a year competition where they go to a random place in America where it seems like there is a murderer and they race to investigate it. And then the first person to hunt down and take out this murderer wins the competition every year. So romantic. So that's how they get to know each other. That's how they fall in love. And I feel like even that synopsis makes this book sound about 10 times more serious than it actually is because the tone is so blasé and silly about everything that's going on. With that, don't expect at any point that this book will make sense. Like these people, it is a miracle that they're not in jail, truly. <laughs> they should be. They like talk about crimes in public places all of the time and just do other very careless things. But this book is not concerned about realism, okay? It just wants you to have a good time. So that's what I'm trying to do. And I can 
cannot decide how I feel about this so far. I will say I have a deep respect for authors that just lean all the way into like absolutely ridiculous premises. This is not the kind of thing that you can half-ass. Like if you did, your book would suck, full stop. And she commits to the bit for sure. I also really like crime in books. I really like a good femme fatale. I like things that kind of play with genre. So this feels like the kind of guilty pleasure reading experience that I would just eat right up. Like that's why I was so excited about this book, but it's just not completely hitting for me. And I think that there are two big reasons why. First of all, the insta lust in this book is insane, especially from the man. From the very beginning, like chapter two, Rowan's thoughts whenever he looks at this woman, like this man reminds me of like a horny possessive werewolf howling at the proverbial moon whenever he's in the same place as Sloane at the same time. And you know, sometimes you just have to live with things like this when you're reading something from the new adult TikTok romance wave, but it just, it always icks me out. I never like it. Like you do not need to be straining against your genes on page 13 and then also every page thereafter. There is a time and a place, sir. I guess I just like a slower burn than that. And my other problem so far is that the humor in this book is like so hit or miss. There are some like legitimately funny jokes where dare I say I let out a real chuckle like into the world. I created actual noise. It made my face move in a real way. That's worth something. When this book is at its best, it's camp. It's self-aware. It's pretty silly. But the lows in this book are so low. It's just, I don't know, it can cross the line into being kind of cringe. But overall, it's still fun. I'm still having a good time reading it. It's going really quickly. And I am actually really enjoying the romantic development. Like, they're both crazy people and they're doing like crazy people versions of cute things for each other. For example, Sloane is missing Rowan during this year in between their murder game. And so she flies out to his restaurant because he's a chef by day, he's a murderer only by night and only occasionally. But then she ends up getting spooked about commitment, which fair, I think, for a person like her. So she ends up leaving before she's able to interact with him meaningfully. And so Rowan, sad about this, he flies out to her house and he starts paying this neighborhood kid for the weekend to deliver her groceries for dinners. And then he calls her and he walks her through how to prepare these recipes as if he's not just behind a tree, like a block away from her house, which is a crazy thing to do, but is also cute, I feel, when you consider the type of people that they are. So yeah, who's to say how I actually feel about this book, but I'm gonna keep going, I'm gonna keep reading, and I'll let you know my thoughts as that happens. Okay, off I go. Also, not to out myself, but there's a playlist in this book, right? In depth, by the way, like, like per chapter songs divided playlist. But the only two songs I know on the entire thing are the 21 Pilots song and the Lana Del Rey song. And I just wanted to be vulnerable with you guys and admit that and give you a piece of my past. <clears throat> Pick a safe word, do it now. I swallow hard chainsaw. <laughs> oh, it's so goofy. <laughs> Where am I? Okay. We're two for two on references in these books to milking. <laughs> You're not a cow, you know? At least it was a thought crime in this book. He didn't say it out loud, but I saw it. I will never be free. Onyx has thankfully come to comfort me through the rest of this smut scene. Thanks, buddy. You know, fun fact, cats are actually lactose intolerant. And so am I. Little baby boy, blissfully unaware of the problems in the world. To have a head as empty as yours. Okay, hello. The book is done. We made it. I definitely feel like I like this less than I did when we talked about it earlier today, but I still think that it levels out at probably three stars for me. I really do want to give this book props for creativity. I feel like Bryn Weaver took this idea and just ran with it straight to hell. And I respect her for that. I do. I think it was a lot more interesting and unique in terms of plot than a lot of typical TikTok romance novels are. So points for that for sure. And I did also like the banter. I liked the dynamic that the couple had. I do feel like they had really good romantic chemistry with each other, even though I'm not sure how strong they were as characters on their own. Like I finished the book, it's over. And I feel like I still know only the bare minimum about Sloane's background and personality. And that's like marginally better with Rowan just because he has a bit more personality, but neither of them really have like meaningful character arcs. So it's missing a bit of individual development, but as a couple, I still liked them. But with that said, once things came together for them as a couple, maybe like 60% of the way in or so. The book kind of just became like a lot of smut. And for me as a yearner, as a piner, it was not to my tastes. I'm a self-aware woman. I actually don't think for the most part that it was that badly written or anything. So your mileage may vary. If you like things that are a little bit more intense, you might absolutely adore like the back third of this book, but it just wasn't my kind of thing. And there was a lot of it. It was maybe like four or five chapters worth of smut. In between the smut, there were some cute things like the restaurant, I could die. I could die, I could flutter up into the sky. It was just really sweet. So that was really nice because because also what was left of the plot kind of started to go off of the rails. Like there was this 11th hour plot twist that was just 
so much. That entire plot line was just a lot, but you know what? It all worked out, didn't it, Onyx? Also, the problems that I mentioned earlier remained problems, but they didn't really get any worse, so it was still bearable. And there were a lot of moments that made me smile. Like, I can definitely see why people like this book. It's camp, it's silly, it's fun. I just feel like a victim of TikTok hype yet again, because with the way that people were talking about this book, I like really expected to love it, but I kind of just didn't, and that's okay. Three stars is not bad. I feel like the right kind of reader will absolutely adore this book, but it is definitely Definitely not for everybody, especially if you want anything beyond like a silly goofy time. Also, I do want to PSA that I've heard that the audiobook for this is fantastic. And the male main character is Irish, and I imagine also Irish in the audiobook. It's like dual narrated. So for that alone, it might be especially worthwhile depending on what you're looking for. And that is a wrap on Butcher and Blackbird. The last book I'm reading for this video is Kingdom of the Wicked. And this is a bit of a shift in vibe. It's a viral young adult fantasy romance. And it follows a girl named Amelia. And Amelia and her twin sister Victoria, they're witches. They're like magical beings, but they mostly seem to use their magic to just like exist and run a funky family restaurant in Italy where this book takes place. But all of a sudden at the beginning of this book, this life of relative bliss and normalcy, it's all taken away when Amelia goes out and she finds her sister has been murdered. And the whole thing is very creepy and mysterious. Like Vittoria is wearing what appears to be a wedding dress, except Amelia has never seen it before. Her heart has been like ripped from her chest. It's just missing. Nobody knows where it went. So it's pretty obviously foul play. And even though Amelia was once this like mousy introverted witch girly who just wanted to cook her little sauces and do her little spells. No longer, okay? Life is not so simple anymore because now she is out for vengeance. And so she starts investigating and she ends up summoning a prince of hell who goes by wrath. Like this man is apparently the literal incarnation of the seven deadly sin wrath. So she summons him kind of by accident and like swears him into this bond of protection so he can't hurt her. And together, presumably they investigate what happens. They solve this mystery. Also, he's the love interest, by the way, like the concept of wrath as a dude which let me just say, why wrath? Out of them all, when I'm thinking of a potentially attractive seven deadly sin boyfriend, I feel like the concept of wrath would be close to the bottom of my list. I'm just really not into like rage and violence in my relationships, but that's just me. This is Amelia's life. Anyways, this is fine so far. I'm about like 80 pages in maybe. It is a bit slow. There is so much food. Like they really love to cook food in this restaurant and you will be hearing about it, but it's fine. I see potential. I mean, I feel like I've already predicted the twist, but that's just because I've read more than two or three young adult fantasy series. But you know what? They still surprise me sometimes. So who's to say what'll actually happen? And I've only just met the man in this book. Like he was, he was just yoinked up from the pits of hell and away from whatever duties he has as the concept of wrath, like whatever he gets up to down there. So time will also tell what my opinion of him is, but I am going to cook a little bit, air quotes, cook. I'm going to put some sauce from a jar onto some wagon wheel noodles. Fun shapes for a fun girl. This family would crucify me, but it's what has to be done when you're talentless, but you still to feed yourself. So I'm gonna go do that and I'm also gonna keep reading. I'm a chef, I'm an artisan, I'm just like her. We did that. It's fantastic. <laughs> okay, two things. First of all, the main character of this book, Amelia, is so stupid, like unbelievably stupid. <laughs> this woman, I'm sure, will end up being like a chosen one best to ever do it magician in the future. But right now, with what we've been shown of her magic, she's pretty bad. Like she's just kind of a normie. And she sincerely goes into like a tunnel system and is like, yeah, I could 1v1 a basilisk. Oh, if it bites me once, I'll die unless I make some kind of horrific sacrifice. Don't worry about it. Not gonna come to that. My plan is completely foolproof. And meanwhile, her plan is like using a small handful of herbs to put the basilisk to sleep, except it's not even a good sleep spell because it could wake up for any normal reason like noise or just because it wakes up randomly at any time and this woman sincerely is like i got this i see no flaws and it's giving those men who think they could like beat a grizzly bear in a fight just that blinds confidence it, it's insufferable like she is just so stupid and this is just one example there have been several things so far where when she does them i'm just like why? But the second thing I want to share with you has to do with our man Raph, who I think the author is bafflingly trying to characterize as like just a little guy, like just a little sweet cinnamon roll. He is the incarnation of Raph. This man is literally war. Like, does that mean nothing to you? Because despite the fact that this man is apparently like super mega giga evil, he's done no evil things. He's kind of just sulked and been emo inside of his little cage. And for the record for this apparently all-powerful malevolent entity, he has plenty of reasons to hate Amelia. She's been pretty inconvenient. She's trapped 
trapped him. She asks a bunch of stupid questions. She has somehow managed to put this eternal order of protection on him. And he like appears to hate her for a little while. It's like enemies to lovers. Ooh, hoo, hoo. But then, and I can't make this up. She gives him two cannolis <laughs> and he folds. And now he's like in love with her or something, or at least into her in some weird way. And I just like, you are an immortal being, sir. Two cannolis is enough to buy you? I would like to try these cannolis. I would like to see what all of the hype is about if they can turn immortal Satan spawn creatures into little golden retriever boys. <laughs> because it is so silly. Like, why isn't he evil? He needs to be evil. That's his entire thing. He's from hell. I don't buy it. I think the development in their relationship is really bizarre. Oh, well, you know, we'll see how this continues to go. This book is so silly. Like, a demon will literally brainwash this woman or perform some kind of insane powerful magic. And she is willing to accept all of that as, like, part of the game, part of their powers. But God forbid they know where she lives. One of them is like, I've been to your house. And she's like, how did you know? As if they're not fucking omnipotent. Like, how is that the thing that surprises you about this situation? I'm close to the end. Just the length of this book, if anybody in this family had even a kindergarten ability to communicate, like, it is insane to me how little they talk to each other. There are so many secrets in this book for no reason, just vibes. And I have no respect for that. Like, honestly, Amelia might be stupid, but I kind of do feel like this bitch was set up to fail. Okay, I'm done. I just want to say that this book did in fact go exactly where I expected it to go from the very beginning. And yet, somehow, I feel like the ending also reveals almost nothing. Like, there are still so many questions that are left unanswered. And obviously, this is a series. It's a trilogy, so I imagine that those questions would be answered in future books, but will I be getting there? Will I be continuing the series? Maybe? I don't know. If you've read the entire series and you think it's worth it, let me know, but I'm not sure if it's going to be a big priority. But this wasn't bad. Overall, I thought it was fine. The plot of this book, I feel, can be described as just Amelia walking with absolutely zero thoughts in her head into a variety of dangerous situations. And this happens maybe six or seven separate times inside of this book. She never gets better. Amelia, like, never once learns from her mistakes or her experiences. And I mean, you know what? It always seems to work out for her, so fine. Whatever. But that's really all that happens. It's just Amelia doing some kind kind of dumb thing and then having a high stakes interaction and then entering a refractory period where she has to recover in some way and use upon this interaction that she had. And like, yeah, that's a little bit generic, but it would be fine, maybe, except Amelia also does this thing with every thought inside of her head where once is not enough. Like, this woman has to go through an identical thought process, like, three or four times before she's able to move on from any idea that she has in this book. And you would really think that that would make her, like, super good at critical thinking or introspection or reflection, maybe, on her feelings or her emotions or her plans. No, nope, no, it doesn't. It just makes the book feel kind of repetitive. It was never like that bad, but it was constantly noticeable. There were parts of this book I really enjoyed. I was sat for the introduction of Wrath when this man is initially being bound. He's just being so smarmy and she's being so incredulous and silly. And their banter was just fun. It was like a quirky modern girl makes contact with this weird disgruntled medieval knight. I liked it. I was excited to see where that would go. But throughout the rest of the book, this man, like I already said this, but his cognition just makes no sense sense to me. What is bro thinking? What are bro's motives? Like, you're telling me that this man is the incarnation of war and conflict and rage across the world, but he's also in the garden picking this girl her favorite flowers and, like, weaving her a closet full of clothing and complimenting her cannolis, which are apparently also the best cannolis to ever exist, to ever do it in this entire world. They could even turn his iron heart into gold. I feel like I needed any amount of background on this man, on why Wrath is the way that he is. And truly, girl gave us nothing in this book. I imagine that it must be in the rest of the series, but there's it's not in there. We get some nice scenes with the two of them. We get Wrath doing some cute things, but I just, I feel like I felt so much whiplash in how he was acting. This book is trying to be this incredibly tense enemies to lovers. Oh my goodness, they sure do hate each other, except also they make out sometimes, except they're enemies. They can't do that because they're enemies unless. And it's just not very well developed. I feel like I never really understood why this man liked her. Not to beat a dead horse, but he is literally an immortal incarnation of a primordial emotion. Amelia is quite literally just a girl. In fact, I think she's worse than other girls. She is definitely more dumb. Genuinely, why does he like her? Like, the chemistry that they have just feels so sudden to me. So yeah, I mean, I feel like this is probably another three star, but for a very different reason than Butcher and Blackbird, this was just kind of mid. It's your typical, predictable, young adult fantasy. You know, 
I feel like I was promised it would melt me to my core and I am not amused. That did not happen. So I would say based on that, that it's not worth the hype that you'll see on social media, but it's not like bad. It's just aggressively fine. And take that opinion, you know, with whatever grain of salt you want. Obviously I've only read book one. And with that, that's the end. That's the last book. This was a relatively unsuccessful video, I guess, in terms of ratings, but I feel like only one book was a truly radioactive TikTok wreck, which by my read is a pretty good turnout. No new favorites, unfortunately, in this video, but you know what? Sometimes we lose. That's what we get for playing an honest game. I still hope you had a good time with me this week throughout this deranged adventure, and I'll do this again at some point. You know I will. Book talk is still my home, no matter how much I'm wronged. You gotta acknowledge your roots in life, don't you, Onyx? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Of course, as always, please remember to drop a like, subscribe, maybe, perchance. <laughs> you can't just say perchance. I am tired. I need to go to bed. Okay. We do not have anything else to say tonight, do we, Onyx? No? Okay. Bye.